Welcome to Solutions with Courtney Anderson. I am Courtney Anderson and this is episode 205 of this show. So today in episode 205 we have an, a topic that is part of the Communications Communique series. And our Communications Communique series is all about communications. <laughs> it is a uh, missive. It is a directive where we are focusing on our communication talents. And this, of course, is something that I uh, strongly encourage you to explore. Often when we focus on a lot of our topics and we're talking about whether it's our financial fierceness or we're talking about uh, management magicians or HR heroes, people get so focused on the substance of our information that sometimes they will not uh, give due deference to how important it is and that you look at the way you communicate your substantive knowledge. And that's what our communication series is all about. So thank you. Now, in this specific show, like, you know, sometimes you'll think like, you know, I'm feeling like today's going to be a really good show. Like, you know, maybe like, like sometimes I get a little bit like excited, like, you know, like, and then I think like, wow, like this is like this, the like the best, like, like really? If you haven't guessed, our show topic is, is your verbal crutch creating chaos? Is your verbal crutch creating chaos? And if you were wondering, well, what was all of that like? <laughs> well, what was I doing a few minutes, a few moments ago? I was using a verbal crutch. Our verbal crutches are patterns that we get into, speech patterns, where we just interject habitually phrases or sounds. Mm, you know, like, mm, so, mm. Maybe when we're talking, mm, sometimes mm, we think, mm, and then I want to tell you, mm, okay. So it doesn't even have to be a word. It could be like, uh, it could be okay, it could be a sound, mm, it could be a phrase. Uh, uh, you see what I mean, or or uh, if you know what I what I what I'm thinking. It doesn't matter what it is. It's just a repeated pattern that somebody gets into and that it is so powerful. The excitement that I have about the entire communications communique series is exactly like I said, that we sometimes get so focused on, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to be a master of my substantive area of knowledge or my expertise and professionalism, but we forget how imperative it is that we are able to communicate what we know. You know, we could have the, the secret to the universe, but if we have really poor communication skills, we'll be the only one that has that secret because we're not able to share it with anyone. We can't disseminate it. We're not going to be persuasive if we're uh, trying to uh, encourage other people to uh, pay attention or to take advantage of opportunities. We can't get anything done with really poor communication skills. And, and as I said, it's it's disappointing to me sometimes when I'm uh, out working with either organizations or groups or even individuals doing um, a private executive coaching. And people overlook how imperative your ability to get your information across to other people is. So the whole series is something that I'm really passionate about and a student of. I continue myself to look at my communication skills, my verbal communication skills, uh, my body language, facial expressions, eye contact, breathing, posture. And then, of course, we have the whole area of communications, which are, are, are written uh, communications. So there's a lot in this series that kind of fires me up. I'm fired up. But this specific show is one that when I looked at the, the show lineup, I was giddy. <laughs> because in my day-to-day -day life, and I'm sure in yours, we encounter people who I'm assuming – in most instances are unaware of how serious verbal crutches are.
So whether it's the mm or the uh or yeah, yeah, okay, okay, like, you know what I mean? Yeah, bro, dude, yeah, awesome. I don't care what it is. When you do the repetitive verbal crutch, all that anyone else hears, and I mean all that anyone else hears, is the verbal crutch. So, what I really mean, so, now I think so, and and then we're going to do a focus on so, all you'll hear is the so at a certain point. Whatever my verbal crutch is, that's all that people are going to start to hear because it it drowns out everything else. And the science and the and the uh, the data behind this is fascinating, of course, right? Because there's linguistic issues, and then there's the the entire um, physiology and the physical way that we form sounds. There's also the science behind the the the, the uh, neurology behind this. So where do these come from? How do they manifest? Often what you'll hear with verbal crutches is they'll be they'll trend <laughs> to use a, a a more modern sort of social media idea. So for a while when I was young, there would be a phrase, I don't I don't know, where everyone would use it, right? You know, whatever it was. And then uh later people start to use a different uh verbal crutch. So maybe their verbal crutch was yeah or cool or what's happening, groovy, awesome psych i mean it didn't matter what it was but they'll change so it's it's a it to me like i said this whole area of where do we get these the the verbal crutch from in terms of the sort of macro environment and that they do change they can be contagious so you'll see that in social groups where uh, one person will start using the verbal crutch and then other people start picking up on it and then they start mimicking it and then like i said the whole thing of the why your your body your mouth is forming those those sounds and the the Again, the interaction, right, between your neurons and, and, and the thought process and the physical formation and then the, the rhythm of them. When you look at, at video or you listen to uh, resources, which I strongly encourage you to do, it's, it's almost musical when people are really into uh, utilization of the verbal crutches. And that's why they become so distracting because you, you're using them and they're not – um out of rhythm usually like i said they're 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 spaced and they're used in a way that's that's almost melodic <laughs> and so all of this is really interesting but what does it have to do with the with the part of our show topic uh, about creating chaos okay so so much of what we talk about and all of the different series and all the different uh, individual shows. And, of course, this is episode 205. Wow, 205 episodes of this, of just this show. Uh, so when, when you come to CourtneyAnderson.com, which is our central website, and I, I encourage you to do so, you'll see our, our repository of resources growing um, on a daily basis. And I do hope that you take advantage of all, all of the different uh, shows that we have this uh audio version uh, which is our you know, sort of radio show and then we have our uh, television or video version of this show we have um, upcoming webinars and seminars and um, all different types of resources so I hope that you continue to, to bookmark the site come back and, and take what you what you want when you need it and then come back and revisit us and also let me know how I can be of service what ideas you have but when we talk about creating chaos, one of our fundamental principles of all the different things that we do, you uh, are probably aware, because I repeat it, <laughs> we're focusing on surpassing your goals. And so there's a variety of different types of goals we talk about within your professional life and then within your wider, more important, in many respects, real life. And, of course, we have subtopics on everything from, again, our financial fierceness to management magicians, HR heroes. Of course, this is Communications Communique. We have our Satisfaction Saturation series where we talk about what happens after you've surpassed what you thought were all of your goals. Now what? So we have all these different slices of your life that we're focusing on. But the, the core issue is your ability to truly live. So not to exist, but to, to, to feel like you're alive. 
And so we marshal our resources and we collaborate and we share our, and we work together so that we can identify within as many spheres of your life as possible. So potential solutions, obviously, right? It's the name of the show. So the, the devastation that verbal crutches uh, can create in someone's life are sorely overlooked. So someone says, well, I don't know why I didn't get the promotion. Or I'm not really sure why I wasn't the one that was selected to give the presentation to the big uh, client. Or maybe a student you know, says, well, I don't understand why my grade was not higher. Or I don't understand why I, I wasn't uh, hired you know, for that job. I thought my interview went great. Or someone says, I don't understand why you know, um, I, that I didn't get a second date. I thought that first date was awesome. And many situations, the verbal crutch can and does create chaos. So it may be that you went into a job interview and the substance of your knowledge was exceptional, just fantastic. The challenge, though, is if you're, if you're sitting in the job interview and you're saying things like, it's awesome to be here. One of the most awesome things I've ever thought is how awesome this company is. I mean, it's awesome. And so I was getting ready to, for today, which is awesome. And I was thinking, this is so awesome. I wonder how awesome it would be if I awesome had the opportunity to be, you know, part of this team because it's so awesome. And you're the most awesome, you know, manager. And I awesome have been studying this. And I studied this company for ever. And, and it's so awesome. And it's okay. All that the person is hearing, the interviewer, is the word awesome. And they're so distracted, again, that no matter what you were inserting in between the verbal crutch, it, it literally could have been, again, the secret to the universe, right? Untold wealth, uh, everlasting youth, whatever. But they're not going to hear it because all they heard was you repeating your verbal crutch. I use awesome that time as an example. Uh, it, does this impact socially? Yeah, it does. And people think, well, no, it doesn't. It doesn't impact socially. You know, I got ready socially and I was making a new friend or I was going out potentially for a new romantic um, relationship. And, you know, and I looked great and I smelled nice. I mean, what? Really? What I said? Yeah. <laughs> what you said matters. What you said matters a lot. It's the same thing. No one can hear what you're saying because you're, you have taken the, the substance of your message and you've wrapped it up and this barrier and i i can't even hear what your what your message is because all i'm hearing is this barrier of the verbal crutch and at some point it becomes so grating and annoying that yeah i am going to cut short my time with you i may have thought you looked nice and you smelled nice but i can't listen to that it's annoying Now, I know when I talk to people people and, and, talk, and ask, you know, do you want to not get the job that you're interested in? Do you want to not get uh, admitted to the, to the, to the um, professional organization that you've applied to? Do you want to not go on a second date with someone that you like? Do you want to not do this? I'll say, well, of course not. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. I want that. That's why I went through the hassle of, you know, filling in the paperwork out and applying and going in for the interview. Or that's why I went through the hassle of agreeing to go on the date. I mean, I went through all this hassle because I wanted that thing. And my point to you is then you've got to pay attention to this. The verbal crutch is creating chaos. If you're using it, it's creating chaos. How much chaos it creates is going to be relational to how much you abuse it. There are people who almost every breath, and that's what you, when I said it's melodic and, and you the rhythm of the verbal crutch, it's related. And again, this is something that I really recommend if you're interested in, in addition to the resources that I am going to have on the show page. And of course, CourtneyAnderson.com, our main site. Uh, if you go on there, we have show pages for every single one of the 205 of these shows and all of our other shows and webinars. And those are individual shows where I've got other, you know, notes or links to other programs that are related. I've got also links to other uh, often research or articles that I'll read. And I'll tie back to those show pages, maybe something that I'll see that I'll uh, put on, on Twitter or uh, something that's on my blog. So please keep coming back is my point. But if you're really interested in this, one of the most fascinating things I did, and it was many years ago now, uh, as you can probably surmise, one of the ways that I create joy in my life is through uh, performing. And so performing to a certain extent like this when we're doing our show, performing uh, as a professor when I'm, when I'm uh, providing information to my students, 
uh, in, a, in a university or even informally. Uh, I love giving my speeches, where I do my keynote speeches, and I do my corporate education training programs. I like uh, performing at all different types of events, whether it's a television event that I'm doing a, a television show. So my voice is important. And so, like I was saying, one of the most interesting things I did was early on in my speaking career, and I've done shows on this, where, I, where in, uh, many actually, where I talk about being a professional speaker, which is an unusual uh, career because it's a small uh, industry and not a lot of people have even heard of it. So early on in my speaking career, I didn't even know it was a, a career that it existed. And I've shared in other programs. I sort of stumbled into an internet uh, ad that was looking like late at night when I was working in my law office and a little bit unfulfilled just in terms of fearing that maybe this would be the rest of my life, that, it would, that I would never do anything but exactly what I was doing, you know, at that, at that time in my office. And so I was out searching. Maybe there's some other things I can do to, 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 to add to practicing law that would, might provide me a little bit more diversity of experience. So I found an ad looking for a lawyer and it was actually a company, a seminar company that hired um, and people as contractors to just go on little short contracts, like a week at a time. And they needed a lawyer to do some uh, presentations about some broadly legal issues, not anything complex or super sophisticated but you definitely would would understand why they needed a lawyer just basic things uh i think related if i remember correctly to some human resource issues um and potentially uh, doing a program for for uh like a women's conference but talking about like wills and estates and, and really basic just planning just thinking about your 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 future. So make a long story more exciting. I saw that ad. Fast forward. I take the the opportunity. I audition. I am accepted for a contract for the by the seminar company. I do this first contract for I think four days. Loved it so much. I thought this is really fun. And then off I was over the next couple of years learning about and and the speaking industry and being a speaker. The challenge is I went from speaking as a lawyer. You know, I'm speaking, but I'm not performing. So it's a different type of stress on your vocal cords. And so when I went out speaking and I was speaking for, you know, six hours a day in many instances, because I do all, you know, I do morning sessions and I break and I do the afternoon sessions. And I was projecting and often I didn't use a microphone and I was in all different types of climates and environments because I would be in one city on, on one day and then I'd fly that night to another city and then the next day I'd perform for a day and then that night fly to another city. And so I didn't bother because I'm full of not good choices in life to, to research or plan or anything. And so I was just speaking, speaking, speaking. And by what I'm saying, by not using a microphone, which obviously I'm using right now when we do these shows and I learned the hard way, but I would just go into rooms and I would think, well, I project well. You know, I've been a professor and a lawyer and I've all, I've been speaking, but I wasn't speaking for the duration and I wasn't speaking while traveling in all those different environments while trying to perform as uh, dramatically as I do sometimes when I do these live speaking events. And so what I ended up doing is hurting my, my body. I hurt my vocal cords and nodules developed on my vocal cords. And so it was very serious, especially because that's what I started to realize I love. So fast forward, I'm at, I'm at the doctor and the doctor refers me to a, um, a speech pathologist, which was, that was my point, is that that's one of the most interesting things I had done. And going to the sessions where I learned about all of the vocal hygiene issues that I should have, if I'd been a more uh, prudent person, researched before I went out and blew out my, this, my slang is, it's slang, but I say blew out my vocal cords, what I mean is I endangered my ability to be able to do what I'm doing right now and all the other things I love. Because if I can't speak, I'm not going to be able to practice law the way I do it or, or be a professor or, you know, go on television shows or perform or anything. And forget that. I won't be able to have fun in my regular life because I love telling stories and uh, having fun. And so just not being able to talk would not be great. And so it becomes very serious and you face, uh, you know, there's surgery and things that, that are done. But what I, what I was working on with the speech pathologist pathologist was I was learning all of the things about our, our the breathing, the swallowing, 
the way you treat your vocal cords, the things you do, like the clearing your throat, right? That that, and I'm not going to do it now because it's one of the things that does does hurt my my vocal cords. These things are so important. Even things like I I love you know I drink a lot of water. I always have, which is not a, anything but good, really. The challenge though is I like really cold water, like really cold water. And for my international uh, community members, you're you're thinking, well, yeah, anybody, most people from the states like a lot of ice, right? We like a lot of ice <laughs> and and air conditioning. I know. So, but I do. I like I like cold drinks. So I would I would just get the coldest ice water I could get. And I didn't realize that the that very, very, very low temperature of the of the water would have a negative potential impact on my voice, especially the as much as I was using my voice and as much as I was um, pushing with my diaphragm and through my vocal cords. So all this is to say that there's a lot that goes on in just the act of speech or sound. We don't even need to get to the, the speak the speech of a language, but just sound. And you don't think about it. I didn't, because as I said, it, I made really poor choices. I didn't understand how serious and how sophisticated all this was until I was faced with the doctor telling me, "Well, this is why you're, this is why you're telling me that your your quote throat hurts." Uh, and then I had this specialist who I worked with, and she was phenomenal. And I would go to the and I went to these sessions, and like I said, I learned all of these things about my breathing and my swallowing and my because I used to think, "Well, I have, a, I like to project, I like to speak loudly." Okay, but that's what a microphone is for. And I used to work without microphones because I would say, well, I can handle it. I would do, I would work outdoors and huge, you know, there's 500 people here, no problem. I'll project. And I would feel proud. See, I can do this, right? The problem that I didn't understand was I was hurting myself. And it's like any, I'm going to make this analogy some people may not initially understand. It's, it's like an athlete. You read all the time about who athletes who are, or people are into physical um, fitness who are very serious about it and how imperative it is that you understand how to appropriately and correctly uh, do an exercise, right? How important it is that you understand the correct grip, the correct movement for you know lifting weights or doing a certain type of exercise. And some people who, who aren't into uh, physical fitness may think, well, what does it matter? Who cares? Well, it matters a lot because if you do it incorrectly, you could harm yourself or maybe irreparably injure yourself. That's why it matters. And it's the same thing with these other parts of our body and our voice is one of them. So all I'm here talking to you about is when you look at the verbal crutch, it's part of a larger analysis that you need to have about your vocal practices in general. And so I do encourage you. I do think, I know for me personally, I did not understand how serious and how, again, sophisticated and complex it is when you think about these issues regarding sounds and speaking until I got into a situation where I was facing potentially a surgery and or first trying uh, these uh, sessions and, and learning through the medical professional, my speech pathologist, the, the correct methods to utilize to, to, to protect my, my voice. When you look at your verbal crutch, I'm going to bring out the big guns again. And I've mentioned this type of technique in other programs. And every time I mention it, I know community members, uh, people gasp when I talk about this in, 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 in our simultaneous meetings, whether we're in, in physical space together or we're doing a, a webinar, which I do hope you continue to come to CourtneyAnderson.com and sign up for our, our a new series of webinars we're, we're launching so that we can get to know each other. The big guns I'm bringing out, and I'm going to say it right now, you must force yourself to videotape, and that's an old term, I know because we're not using tape, and I know you're going to probably use a smartphone, but whatever, you understand what I'm saying. You must record yourself speaking, and then you must listen and watch it. That's the big guns. I just said it. I know many of you are saying, (gasps) I can't imagine anything worse than that. And I've shared in other programs that one of the turning points in my life, and I do believe in my entire life, and I didn't understand it at the time, and this had to be, I was probably 21 years old. So I was in law school. 
and we had a course where we were doing what they call mock trial and that's where lawyers who were you know we were in school so we're studying to be uh, lawyers hopefully if we succeeded and we went out and we did what we learned the, what you would do if you were successful in becoming an attorney in a trial and they filmed us now this is when I was 21 years old this was not yesterday I know many of you are thinking you're not 21 now I know right ah <sighs> the reality is that I had not had many opportunities in my life before then to ever hear and see myself filmed. Now, I know that people who might be younger are thinking, well, how's that possible? Well, it's possible because the technology today where on your phone is, is, a, is a sophisticated computer that also is something that allows you to make movies <laughs> I mean the idea of that it was like you know a, a, a science fiction film or something when I was growing up that didn't exist to record somebody you had to have really expensive really specialized uh, equipment like physical big huge equipment and then you had to have th- something recorded on like literally like film so average people didn't do stuff like this and so most people before the technology that exists today hadn't had many experiences seeing themselves because you know the technology didn't exist so 21 years old in this program they force us as part of the course so not forced that i was forced to be there in the school but as part of the course program they were going to have us practicing all the substantive issues we would need to be able to do as a lawyer to understand um our, our, our tasks and requirements but they also were going to record us and then force us to, to see it and hear it and when that happened like I said at the time all I all I realized at the time when they it was so we're in a group right all students in a class and we're filmed and we have to watch it back the, all I thought at the time was I thought two things one how embarrassed I was and it took everything in me not to just start just burst out crying and the second thing I did then is, of course, as I got angry, because which we, what we often will do in life when we're uncomfortable. So I was uncomfortable because I was embarrassed. And one of the things that I was really embarrassed about is when I, I prided myself delusionally. <laughs> it was a delusion. I, I prided myself before that on, quote, being a good speaker because that's what people have told me. And then I and then I saw the evidence. And one of the things that I still remember to this moment is how much I abused a verbal crutch. I cannot recall exactly what the verbal crutch was. I think I used okay. And most of you think look at the word okay and you think, well, that's a simple word. Okay. That's used in many parts of the world. Okay. You know, it means everything's okay. So what could be wrong with it? Well, if you saw the evidence. There I am thinking I'm doing a great job that I really understand the substance and I was um, remember practicing what a lawyer would do uh, in a legal uh, setting addressing uh, someone who would be a potential witness, right? In a case. And all you hear is me doing things like Okay, okay, so uh, Mr. Smith, okay, okay, so Mr. Smith, it was about 4 p.m., okay, okay, is that, okay, 4 p.m., okay, on a Tuesday, okay, Mr. Smith, okay, and it was, okay, my client, okay, okay, Mr. Smith, okay, now you're thinking, okay, all you heard was the verbal grudge. And I was embarrassed because people started to giggle. And they weren't laughing with me. They were laughing at me. And they should have been. And I was angry, but I was angry at myself. Because I hadn't asked for help earlier. And I hadn't... Here's the thing that's so weird about the verbal crutch. When you speak, you hear yourself. So I can't even say, Oh, I can't believe nobody else told me about this. I'm right there. It's not like something happened and I was unaware of it. I was in some other room and I was like, what? What happened with the verbal crutch? I was there doing it in my own body, my physical body, as I mentioned earlier. My speech pathologist helping me with my vocal hygiene and using my my diaphragm and my breathing and and the way I'm forming my words and taking care of my vocal cords. And I here I I'm in my body and I did it. And then I acted like I didn't even realize it. I was right there at the scene of the crime. <laughs> Had that not happened, 
as jarring as it was, as as shocking as it was, as embarrassing as it was, I potentially never would have been able to become even slightly better. And then, of course, being able to complete law school and become licensed as an attorney allowed me to open my law firm. Opening my law firm allowed me then the, the financial success and the and the confidence to be able to then even expand my world by finding the little ad on the internet and going and starting to do seminars and learning about professional speaking and then moving in that direction and then later adding you know television and all different types of exciting things and being here today all of that is predicated on me understanding at least beginning to understand how important it is that I focus on my communications and not just on the content again you could have the secret to the universe and no one can hear it because your verbal crutch it's created professional chaos. That's why you didn't get the job. That's why they didn't want you to give the presentation. That's why you're not going to get the promotion. That's why people don't take you seriously. It creates personal chaos. Not with the people who love you unconditionally. Those people love you. They're never going to, you know. So whoever is, we talk about in programs, I mentioned this community of caring, and those are whoever in your world meets that test of your happiness is their happiness and simultaneously you must reciprocate that their happiness is your happiness so those people of course I don't care what happens they're they're there they're not going to ever not be there and they may have tried to say something to you it's interesting I was talking to somebody socially a little while ago who was using a verbal crutch and I was and I mentioned it and I think she was using a verbal crutch you know what I mean and she kept doing it, and at one, and I finally said to her something like, "I don't know what you mean," because it was so it, it becomes grating, right? And then she started to laugh, and then she said, "Oh yeah," she said, "My boyfriend mentioned that to me the other day, <laughs> the same thing." And I'm thinking, okay, now he and he's a really you know great nice person. So I'm thinking, all right, so he's a great nice person. He said that we've I've known you you know I think probably 14, 15 years, and not, and yet she's still doing it. Not that it's not gonna, it's not going to impact how much people care about her that are in her community of caring, but what I'm saying is that even when people do try to bring it up, we brush it aside sometimes. Oh, they're just so funny. Isn't that funny? You guys said the same thing. Okay, well, <laughs> then maybe. Because someone who cares about you in your personal life, even the people in your community of caring, they're not going to ever leave. Right? They're not going to ever not feel for you. They may not be able to, you know, physically be in the same town with you or have the same type of relationship all the time because something might be happening in their life, but they, you know, they care for you. It's just that it takes away their ability to hear what you have to say, and they really want to hear it. That's why they're in your community of caring. They're volunteering, and they're really interested, and they want to know what's happening, but you can't get that message across because they're so distracted and 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 pummeled by these verbal assaults or these never-ending verbal crutches. But if it's a new relationship, a new friendship, a new uh, potential romantic relationship, it it makes an impression. So the bigger question I know that people may have is, well, how do you stop them then? And that obviously is a whole nother <laughs> show. This was an awareness program, but let's hit on some of those um, big picture issues. How do you stop any behavior? It's a habit. Like I said, you know you're doing it because it, you're forming, we talked about, there's a very sophisticated, complex, psychological, uh, neuro, uh, neurological, uh, physical relationship between forming the sounds and, and, and the intent to, to create the sounds uh, and using languages and then doing it. So all that is really interesting, but you're doing it and you're in your own body. So you are aware you're doing it because your physical mouth and your vocal cords, your diaphragm's moving, you're doing this. So it's not like you weren't there. Like I said, you're at the scene of the crime. So the first problem, of course, is denial. You have to admit it's you. And the only way that I know to do it without any more games, without any more excuses or rationalizations, right? Those are the rationalizations of the lies we tell ourselves. And those would be like, oh, I know I do that, but I don't know how to stop it. That's a lie. Yes, you do, because you're forming the sound. You do know how to stop. You have to see it and hear it. And yes, it's embarrassing. You may be hurt. People may. Only if you're in a maybe competitive environment like I was in a class. People weren't cruel at all. They just were sort of giggling a little bit. But it was funny. It was distracting. 
do it by yourself if you if now we have the technology right make a selfie video <laughs> i don't even know if that's the right term how people <laughs> but you know if you don't want anybody else to see it do it yourself and then now once you're aware of it then all you have to do is think and be aware of what you're saying and doing and this also ties back to my point earlier when i told my little story about how i learned about uh, vocal hygiene because i was abusing my vocal cords with you know incorrect temperature not understanding hydration my breathing technique my swallowing technique my um sort of guttural stops and clearing the what I clearing the throat there were a lot of things I was doing to create the problem not using a microphone uh, abusing the muscles um, my poor larynx so there's a lot that I learned and one of the things that it did is it forced me to be conscious and mindful of all this that was happening and like I said earlier most people who aren't paying attention we don't notice just like I said earlier, an athlete who does understand how I, my form and my technique for doing that, that exercise matters immensely. We need to be more mindful. Now, we all don't need to go out and drop everything that we're doing right now and spend, you know, 10 years becoming experts, uh, or not even experts, but at least somewhat knowledgeable people in, in the area of speech and uh, linguistics because that's a that's an entire lifetime that we'd we'd have to put into that what i'm saying is that just sort of being blasé and and acting as if it doesn't matter is inaccurate it does matter it your verbal crutch is creating chaos professionally and personally and and you don't you're better than this so how you're going to stop it is one you're going to force yourself to see what it is you're doing and then you're going to force yourself to write it down like i said people use different things and sometimes what will happen is you'll you'll realize that you're using one verbal crutch. Maybe it's okay. And so then you'll stop using okay, but all you'll do is replace it with another one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, the idea is to stop the verbal crutch at all. You don't replace it with anything but silence. Because you need the silence so that the actual message of your content gets through. Remember, the verbal crutch drowns your content in the verbal crutch. And prevents anybody from even really focusing or hearing what you're saying. So what you do when you take away the verbal crutches totally. When you just put silence in there. And then you use the silence to highlight the actual content. So it's awareness. And then and it's the other thing that people sometimes get very upset about. You have to practice this. Some 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 people have asked me, well, how long does it take to change a habit? And, you know, I can find a resource. I'm not, you know, varying levels of credibility, but you know, some resources tell you it takes you know seven days to change a habit, or it takes 21 days, or 30 days, or it takes 10,000 hours, or whatever. I mean, who knows? But not not saying who knows flippantly. I'm saying maybe maybe someone does actually have the answer to the question. What I'm saying is you have to continue to be vigilant. Period. Done. Like going forward. I mentioned when I was 21 years old, I had a very, or somewhere in that range, I had a very, you know, embarrassing and painful wake-up call when I was, when I heard and saw for an extended period of time. So not like 30 seconds of it, but I had to sit there for, you know, eight minutes or something and listen to it. Listen to it, I, me, with the verbal crutch and all the other horrible, ridiculous things I was doing. So I still have the same predilections and habits you know i'll still want to fall back into verbal crutches and, and i'm i'm this wasn't yesterday that i first became painfully aware of this i'm still on guard i still do this and of course the more informal the setting the easier it is now i'm i try to be more mindful when i'm giving a big presentation or a lecture or uh, you know a live television show because there's it's a it's a very a short duration amount of time and there's a very specific focus so it's actually easier for me and in those professional settings because I, I'm so focused on what we're doing and I, and I and I really understand how imperative it is that my verbal crutch is in is 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 nowhere to be seen the challenge will be when I relax or I'm hanging out with with people in regular life just doing fun stuff I'll slide back into the verbal crutch and like I said, they'll change over time. So whatever people are using in society, whatever, sometimes when I travel, I'll pick up other verbal crutches in other parts of the world. All of this, I'm not immune. You're not immune. We have to be vigilant. This is going to be an ongoing issue. And you fill the verbal crutch with silence. Silence is incredibly powerful. 
So it's awareness, it's monitoring, it's vigilance. It's as soon as you catch yourself doing it again, because of course you've been vigilant and monitoring, you immediately again eradicate it. Not just that word or phrase or whatever sound you were making, but you eradicate any vocalization at all and you replace it with what? Silence. And then you keep practicing so that you don't have stilted conversations. You know, silence, of course, cannot, can, can be very effective. It can also be uh, abused like anything else. And it can sound as if you're stilted and that you're taking so long to, quote, gather your thoughts that other people, have, by the time you finally say something, they've fallen asleep. So that's going to be a different type of issue with looking at the pacing of what you're, you're using in terms of your vocalization, the speed at which you speak. All of these we I've done. Uh, presentations and speeches and programs and we'll continue to do shows on these specific issues so there's a lot that goes into your entire uh, communication uh, toolkit but definitely with the verbal crutch you have to ban you have to you have to banish it forever I mean permanently you take that crutch and you got to break it and you got to put it in little pieces and then you got to throw it on a fire and burn it up you don't ever want the verbal crutch to come back it is incredible incredibly destructive it is incredibly destructive and I'll, I'll i'll mention this as we close it's interesting i'll, I'll when i'm relaxing sometimes i'll just sit and flip through uh internet or or tv and often i'll see people i don't really know so i'll watch maybe something on sports and i don't know everybody in every sport neither do you especially around the world but there are interesting public reactions when it's someone whose job is not necessarily based on public speaking so that's why i use sports and they'll say something in an interview and i'll see often in um post game um, press conference and things like that where the where the athletes who are clearly since they're on the uh, press conference and it's and they're on the elite or premier sporting league in that part of the world then obviously they're you know incredibly talented and they're, you know geniuses at what they do but the uh, but the use of verbal crutches is really prevalent in a lot of these areas because people don't necessarily, I think, put a lot of uh, time and energy into that part of their professional life. And you may think, well, who cares? They're a professional athlete. You know, they, they're a baseball player or, or, or a um, American football player or a cricket player or, you know, tennis player. Like, who cares? Well, they care because, and I've worked with and done – corporate education and training programs and some individual programs with people, especially when someone who is a, a sporting professional, if you're good enough again to be on that on that press conference to be on the internet or television, then you're then you're good enough, then you then you could have taken the fact that you have that platform and if you did have more effective uh, speaking skills and you got rid of that verbal crutch, it will help you get better financial opportunities, endorsements. We see really really savvy people i've seen uh, there's an america i believe it was and i'm doing this and this is really not my area there's a person in the in the states he was an american football player very you know very successful has excellent communication skills and parlayed those not just into endorsements for products and commercials and advertising but also into a television career and not just television career for for the same sporting uh, areas that, that his professional experience was but also but into other areas morning talk shows and other types of entertainment and that is not something that everybody wants to do but to have the ability to utilize your knowledge expertise which i said could be the secret to the universe with these really high level communication skills will impact people and give them incredible advantages so yeah, the verbal crutch matters. I don't care what you do. I don't care where you are. I don't care if you were like me when I learned this and I was relatively young. I would have been happier maybe if I'd learned this at 15 <laughs> than 21. But wherever you are, this is important. How do you convey yourself to the world? And the verbal crutch will hurt you. Take it, break it, burn it, banish it. Right? I really... I'm grateful that you came uh, and stayed today in our program. I do ask that you reach out. Uh, let me know if you have any show ideas. I am on Twitter, uh, at Zealous Business. And I do appreciate all of the wonderful uh, things that you do to share our program and your own social media, uh, to leave ratings and reviews, whether in iTunes or Stitcher or Spreaker. These are distribution channels we have around the world. And I really do appreciate you uh, supporting our show sponsors and, and um 
purchasing goods and services through through the links and ads on our website and for signing up for webinars and and uh, pre-ordering ebooks and all the wonderful things that happen so uh, thank you and get get on target and on task start now set a time to watch that first recording and listen to what you're doing And I have tremendous confidence that the verbal crutch is not going to create any additional chaos in your life. Thank you.